Tonight, um, we're going to talk about a very fun subject, and it's important that you receive the message, not just hear it. You're, you're sitting under anointing, and the purpose is not for you to listen and admire. It's for you to take and receive. Can you get greedy tonight? Take it, okay? It's yours. It's all yours. There's certain vocabulary in Christianity and churchianity that we all know, we all use. We've said it a hundred times in church. We've probably read about it a thousand times in scripture, and we know it, but we don't actually know it. Vague terms, different, if, if I went around and asked every single person in this room for a definition, let's say about the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? There'd probably be 200 different answers. Everyone would probably be in the ballpark, but what actually is that? Or the word anointing. People overuse this word. Like, oh, that worship was anointed. Okay, maybe, but when they say, oh, those nachos were so anointed tonight. That, that, no, 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 we gotta, no. Tonight we're gonna talk about one of these words that is kind of hard to pin down. Everyone knows it, everyone said it, and it's the word glory. And I wanna talk about why glory is so important and how it actually impacts us. This is, it's easy to miss the impact of glory, but this is for a part-time school, we only see our part-timers for 13 weeks, for 13 Monday nights. And it's such an important topic that it makes the top 13 for us. This is a big deal. Many times in church history, many times in biblical history, God will come in ways that we don't expect and in ways that we don't even want. And we can't use offense as the test to see if it's God or not. We cannot use offense as the litmus test to figure out if this is God. People say, I'm offended, therefore this can't be God. Well, I'm so sorry, but biblically, man's offense was never once used as the qualifier to figure out if it was God. I would say almost always, biblically, God showed up in ways that offended minds and intellect. Almost always. Can you name a Bible story that makes sense? Go ahead and try. The ones that do make sense don't end well. The people, yeah, exactly. The people who were the most offended and were 100% sure that it wasn't God killed the Son of God. They were the surest of the sure. Jesus came in ways that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the experts of the law didn't like, and they said, this can't be God. We're offended at how he showed up. And these were the people who had studied their entire lives they had to memorize the first five books of the entire Old Testament just to get into Pharisee school. They'd study for, I think it was 30 years, and they were studying so that they would recognize their Messiah. The whole point was to recognize their Messiah. But because of the preconceived notions, because of the preconceived boxes, when he did show up and didn't fit their boxes, they were so offended that they killed him. The easiest way to see the religious offended is for God to show up. Because it usually doesn't make sense. Do not use offense as your test to figure out if it's God or not. And this is something that we take a lot of time with our students and, and try to walk them through. It's so important to learn to actually recognize him. You know, in order to get into our full-time school, there's a lengthy application process. And we ask potential students, what are some of your spiritual strengths? What are things you want to grow in? And I would say the number one answer that students say is that they move in discernment. And one of the number one things that they say they want to grow in but don't really walk in is the prophetic. And I want to tell you that discernment is a prophetic gift. So if you think you're discerning but you're not prophetic, I question your discernment. I'll explain that. But, but this, is, this is important. Many people think they're moving in discernment when they're really moving in offense. And here's the question that we have to ask. Can we discern past our offense? Can we worship past our offense? Well, I don't like this music. I don't like this style. I don't like this volume. I don't like this. Well, okay, but can you worship him through your offense? Can you recognize him past your offense? I would say that a lot of Christians can't. And what most people think is discernment is just them knowing what they like and what they dislike. In other words, discernment is not preference. Knowing what you like and don't like, congratulations. You're a human being. That's not discernment. 
Certain things, like glory, we don't want to over-intellectualize. Uh, parts of God, there are many parts of God, I would say probably every part of God, is based in mystery. And it's not supposed to be super clear-cut. God isn't meant to be understood through intellect of the mind. He's meant to be understood through the understanding of the heart. And so I, I don't fully understand glory. I can't give you a great definition for glory, but I've experienced glory, and it's changed everything. Hebrews 1.3, let's go there. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. The first he, where it says, and he, that's Jesus. The second his, that's God. So Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. This verse is talking about God's glory. Would you agree? And it says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Let me rephrase that for you. Jesus is the glory of God manifesting. I want to point out three things about glory. There's many things that we could talk about, but three I want to share tonight that glory can be. The first thing is that glory can be overpowering. There's so many biblical examples. I want to give you just a couple, but I know you know more. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. It says, It happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. I want you to note that they couldn't minister because of the glory of the Lord. And in this case, the glory manifested as a cloud. If anyone ever tells you glory clouds aren't biblical, they just don't know their Bible. It's actually Old Testament and New Testament. I will show you. <laughs> Promise. Here's another example, Exodus 40, verses 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You know, pause. Uh, we need to pause. Turn your, turn your affections to him. You're beautiful. You're perfect. Perfect in all of your ways. Turn your affections. Love him. Worship him. You're perfect. There's none like you. You're the light in the darkness. Your life, your hope, your joy. You're beautiful. Beautiful. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all of their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night, in the sight of all of the house of Israel. This was another overpowering glory cloud. Did you know that in the old covenant, you couldn't enter the cloud, but in the new covenant, you're called into the cloud. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah showed up and he had three of his disciples with him, it says a cloud showed up. And it, this is a wild verse. It wasn't Jesus, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Elijah. It was all, five of, or all six of the people on that mountain. It says they walked into the cloud. Under the old covenant, glory overpowered you, but in the new covenant, you're welcomed into the glory. I want to read a passage that you're very familiar with, um, but I noticed something about it a little bit later in life that I'd never seen in the probably hundreds of times I've read this. I want to read John 18, a few verses from there. This is the arrest of Jesus. It says, the Pharisees and the leading priests had given Judas a large detachment of Roman soldiers, or uh, a Roman cohort, as some translations say, and the temple, of, the temple police to seize Jesus. Judas guided them to the garden, all of them carrying torches and lanterns and armed with swords and spears. Jesus, knowing full well what was about to happen, went out to the garden entrance to meet them. Stepping forward, he said, who are you looking for? 
Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Now Judas the traitor was among them. He replied, I am he. Go to that next slide. I am he. I want you to understand what actually happened here. This was not a small group of soldiers. If you look up what a Roman cohort was, it was somewhere between 300 and 800 armed guards. These weren't townspeople. These were the SWAT team of that day. The other gospels say that there were other officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. This one says, and also the, chief, or the temple police. The other gospels say a great multitude gathered on the mountain to arrest Jesus. And the verbiage is that it's a massive crowd, an enormous crowd came to get Jesus. And they literally filled the hillside where Jesus was. We're talking potentially of over a thousand armed SWAT team guards coming to get Jesus. Here's the part I never noticed. Let's go to verse six. And the moment Jesus spoke the words, I am he, the mob fell backward to the ground. A hillside of soldiers were knocked off their feet when the son of God said, I am he. And when Jesus said, I am he, it's the same language that Moses used at the burning bush, when, or that God used with Moses when he says, I am. He says, tell them the I am that I am sent you. When Jesus said, I am, it's the same, it's another language, but it's the same verbiage that means I am God. And a hillside of soldiers get knocked off their feet by glory. Glory can be overpowering. Glory can also be transferred. So it can be overpowering and it can be transferred. And it can be transferred in three different ways. The first way is that it can be transferred from God to man. Let's look at John 17, 22. This is Jesus talking. He says, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. In other words, there is a transference on some spiritual level, level where Jesus gives glory to his disciples. Here's a well-known one out of Exodus 34, talking about Moses. So he, Moses, was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been, he'd been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And when Moses had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. God transferred glory to Moses. And somehow, we don't know how this works, but his skin absorbed it. And he had a shining face to the point where it frightened his people. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name and who I have created for my glory. You were created for glory. You were created to worship. You're created to carry glory. There's a whole lot of things, but carrying glory, if you were created to carry glory, it means he gives it to you. People say, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't have any glory. You know, If he's giving it to you, you're not stealing glory from him. And if you think you're going to give him glory when you think you don't have it, how can you give away what you don't carry? Do you want to glorify him? Then you better learn how to receive glory from God. You were created for it. Glory, okay, so God can transfer glory to man. Glory comes from God, but it can also be transferred from man back to God. So Isaiah 42, 12, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise. It doesn't just say when you praise him, it glorifies him. No, it says give him glory and praise. It's not a metaphor. I think that this is actually something, a spiritual, tangible nature to this. We'll talk more a little bit about worship. In it. I can't come here and not talk about worship. We'll talk about worship a little bit. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, but to your name we give glory. There's probably a dozen other verses you can think of instantly that talk about giving glory to God. I firmly believe that there's a literal 
nature to this. And I, I think one of the reasons why worship is so important is because there's an actual transference of us giving him glory. The glory that we were created for, the glory that Jesus says, the glory I have, I have given to them. You have glory and you can give it back to him. Glory can come from God, go to man. Man can give glory to God. But did you know glory, it comes from God, but it can also be transferred from man to man. Let's go to Acts 19. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, not just regular ones. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Go to Acts 15, 5 through 16. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least, what's at most? At least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. What do you think just happened there? People were lining the streets to touch Peter's shadow. Why? Do you think that just one day they decided, hey, Peter's a really holy guy. Maybe if we line up all of our sick people, maybe his shadow might heal us. Or do you think maybe one day Peter was ministering and even those who he didn't touch but his shadow passed by got healed? And they said, this is amazing. Go get all the sick. Because even just his shadow healed them all. I need you to understand that with Paul's handkerchief and Peter's shadow, this wasn't a magical handkerchief. There was no pixie dust. There were no unicorn horns that they ground up and made these things special. What do you think was transferred in those items? I would suggest it's glory. If it can be absorbed in Moses' skin, why can't it be in Paul's handkerchief? Why can't it be in Peter's shadow? And people say, oh, that's getting dangerous. Okay, fine, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the hem of Jesus' garment. When the woman with the issue of blood came to Jesus, I just need to say this, she didn't wait for Jesus to come to her. Okay? You follow that rabbit trail on your own. She did not wait for him to come to him. She fought through the crowd, and she did not touch his skin. She did not grab his feet, his hand, his face. She touched his garment. And he says, virtue just left me. Something just left me. Who touched me? I would suggest glory came through that handkerchief, that shadow, that hem of his garment. And listen, I don't understand that intellectually, but my lack of understanding doesn't make it less true. Yeah? The offense to my intellect does not become a legitimacy test to say that's, that's not God. Glory can be overpowering, glory can be transferred, and glory can transform our very being. This is where glory starts to take personal root with us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And because of his glory, say glory, because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Keep that slide up there. It's because of his glory and excellence that we have promises that enable us to, enable us to do two things. The first thing, according to scripture, that glory and his excellence cause us to do is become like God. It says you share his divine nature. The second thing is you get to escape sin. Glory is important. I want to share in his divine nature. I want to look like Jesus through and through. I want to escape sin. That means I need to start paying attention to this idea about glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Who is the glory of the Lord? Jesus beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. In other words, beholding his glory transforms us. According to this verse, what does it transform us into? His image. Listen, if, if we behold him, the expectation is that we start to look like him. 
And if we behold him, the expectation is that we start to act like him. You become like what you behold. Have you heard that? Be careful where you put your gaze because you will become like that. So if you behold the glory of the Lord, who is Jesus, you will look like Jesus. Do you want to look like Jesus? Start beholding the glory. Glory is important. Don't go back to this slide, but one of the first slides I showed you was Hebrews 1.3 that said Jesus is the glory of God. When you behold God's glory, you are beholding Jesus. And I will never stand in front of him and say glory is not important if that's who he is. Scripturally, names, specifically the names of God, always mean two things. They always uh, represent his nature, what he's like, and they're always promises. So when, when we say, okay, for example, Jehovah Rapha, I am the God who heals you. What he's doing is he's saying, that's my name. That's my nature. That's my DNA. You can't separate me from these things. That's who I am. I am the God who heals you. It's also a promise where he's saying, I'm the God who heals you. Jehovah Jireh, I am your provider. He's saying, I like to provide. It's who I am. It's my job. It's my duty. You can't separate me from provision. It's also a promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That means he's going to provide for you because that's his nature. Did you know that one of God's names, which reveal his name, his nature, and promises, one of his names is, is glory. Listen to this, 2 Peter 1.17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And if you look that up in your Bible, majestic glory is capitalized. It's his name. It's his nature It's who he is. It's what he likes. Biblically speaking, when God comes, certain things always come with him. Angels always come with him. They always go before him. They surround him and they come after him. People get, listen, we can have a whole night of just talking about angelic encounters and stories. Next year, angelic encounter stories. If, and I know, I know that can be a stretch for people, but listen, do not fear was the first thing that angels always told people when there was fear surrounding that. And the reason why you don't want to fear is because they've been in the throne room beholding the majestic glory. And what happens when you behold glory? You become like him. If you see angels, it's probably a good sign that God is near because he's always surrounded by them. When God comes, healing always comes. It says healing is on his wings. It's his name. It's his nature. When God comes, peace always comes. You cannot separate him from it because he is the prince of peace. When he comes, comfort always comes. You can't separate him from it. It's his name. He's comforter. When he comes, there will be comfort. Glory is one of those things. He's the majestic glory. It's always attached to him. It's who he is. He comes, he brings glory, and he makes us like that. The word glory, biblically, shows up in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What language is the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. In Hebrew, in your Old Testament, the word for glory is kabod. You can put that on the screen, kabod. It's mentioned over 200 times in the Old Testament. Here's a short definition to be heavy, weighty, and burdensome. And you can suddenly start thinking about when when the glory cloud of the Lord would come and the priest couldn't minister. It's because it was heavy. It was burdensome. It was weighty. Go to the next slide. I will let you read this. This is a longer definition of what that word kabod actually means. The glory of the Lord is actually tangible, not just in your spirit, but physically. How many of you have felt the glory of the Lord? Even tonight, there's a heaviness, there's a weight of his wonderful majesty. It's because he's the majestic glory, and it's weighty. That's, you're literally discerning glory. In the New Testament, what language is the New Testament written in? Greek? A bunch of scholars. Smart and beautiful, you guys. The New Testament word for glory is doxa. It means glory, honor, praise, dignity. It's mentioned 167 times in your New Testament. 
Go to the longer definition, please. I'll let you read it. If his presence can't be separated from glory, his name is glory, his attributes are glory, his promise is glory, it should stand to reason that we should be somewhat familiar with glory if God is showing up at our church. Unfortunately, in many circles, I think that glory has been absent, been absent for so long that when it does show, people think it's the devil. And when something's been gone for so long, you start to not be able to recognize it. And I just, one of the beautiful things, again, this has nothing to do with us. We just give him the room at church, at Kingdom Living. But one of the beautiful things that we've been marked by is just the heaviness of his presence when we gather. And it, it's not hard. It's not something you can manufacture. It's literally a submission issue, just getting out of the way, giving him the room. Can you recognize his glory? Because people say, well, everyone can recognize his glory. If it was a tangible thing, we should all be able to know it once we experience it. But I would say that's not true. That's not necessarily automatic because the Pharisees couldn't recognize it. The Roman cohort couldn't recognize it after they knocked them off their feet. There has to be a spiritual discernment. Isaiah 6.3 says that the whole earth is present tense, full of his glory. Let me, let me break this verse down. Not future glory, now glory. And Isaiah wrote this a long time ago, so it's been around even before this moment. There's nothing left for him to do, but there is something for us to do to move in this glory. It, the whole earth is full of it. It's filled to the brim with his glory. There, it's unending measures of his glory. But it's up to us to discern it and cooperate with it. Let me, let me break this down. Why is it that when, if you're in a, a church service, an event, something where it's just you feel the glory of the Lord and you're getting wrecked and rocked and all the cool Christian words, you're just getting a, made a mess out of. And then the person next to you is sitting there wondering, what time does this thing get over? What time's the game on today? How do I get out of here? And I think it's the same reason that Jesus produced 11 world changers and one person who sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. It's not on him. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's on us. It comes with him. Do we recognize it? This is a heart issue. I think the difference is those who seek it. Those who celebrate it. Those who make it a priority to gaze upon him. To lavish him. To value him. This is why we celebrate the glory of the Lord whether we feel it or not because it has to be bigger than my feelings. We cannot go by feelings. I love feelings. God has feelings. It's all throughout your book. Read the book. It's in the book. But they never lead us. And so I love the chills. I love the thrills. I'm a feeler when God comes in the room. I, I can sense what he's doing. I actually physically perceive it. But if I can't perceive him, I can't assume that he's not operating. Can't go by our feelings. Uh, one of our dear friends, Jonas Nystrom, who came here a few years ago with me, he's over in Sweden. He's a missionary. This is one of the most amazing men of God I've ever met. Um, he knows, Jonas knows everything. Him and God, they know everything. If I have theological questions, I go to God and then Jonas in that order. Um, Jonas used to uh, be a youth pastor 20 years ago in Sweden. It was this tiny little church out in the woods, 100, 150 people on a good day. And they had a revival, not a churchianity revival, but a biblical revival. And they started seeing the most radical things, some of the most radical things I've ever heard of. He, I think he shared some of his testimony when he was here, but it literally changed the course of history for the town they were living in. But I want to tell you just a small portion of this story. So he was, he was the youth pastor at the time, and the glory of the Lord was so preeminent in their gatherings that he said when they had their youth meetings, he had to limit 
how often he said the name Jesus. Because any time he would say the name of Jesus, the entire room of 50 or 100 youth would get knocked off their feet. And listen, he would literally have to carry them home over his shoulder, hand them to their unsaved parents, and explain that this isn't alcohol, this isn't drugs, this is Jesus. Jonas was on international European television multiple times because of this revival happening in this 150-person church. And it wasn't like, hey, here's a pastor. It was Jonas. What is the Lord doing? And multiple times, internationally, in Europe, he was able to preach the gospel and tell them that Jesus is real. He's moving. He's, he's saving lives. He's, you know, like the whole shebang. And this is the crazy thing about Jonas. He's not a feeler. He's, one time, he told me this. He said, Sam, all I want, like if I have one wish, I just want to feel the presence of the Lord. I've never felt it. I've never gotten the tingles. I don't know. He just says, I just know who my dad is, essentially, and I trust him. Don't go by your feelings, okay? And if you can't feel him, it does not mean that he's not operating. Let me, let me backtrack. Go to um, John 17, 22. Should be the next slide. This is Jesus saying, The glory which you have given me, I have given, past tense, to them, that they may be one just as we are one. First, again, notice from this verse, we have glory. Do you have glory? You have glory. Does this side of the room have glory? I don't know about this side. Okay, this side has glory. Okay. There are so many biblical references to this. Again, how else can you give glory to the Lord if you do not receive glory from the Lord? The second thing about this verse is that it says that glory unites. Jesus says, the glory that united me with him actually unites you with each other. What does that say when there is no glory discerned in a gathering. It's probably going to be a lot of division. It's very simple. I want to read a very short paragraph. Um, This is by Randy Clark. I love Randy. He says, how does God reveal his glory? The Bible contains 18 different categories, not instances, but 18 categories where the glory of God is mentioned. And by far, the largest category is miracles and healings where God's glory is connected 30 times to demonstration of his power through the working of signs, wonders, and miracles. Based on this fact, we can say that the main way God reveals his glory is through signs, wonders, and miracles. This puts a new perspective on the phrase, don't touch his glory. Are we not in some way robbing God of his glory when we hold a cessationist view of God's continued activity in the world? Jesus explicitly stated that it's God's will for us to bring him glory, and the emphasis was related to doing the works Jesus himself had been doing. Jesus didn't do the signs, wonders, and miracles to authenticate his message. They were used to validate what he said. They were an expression of his message. I'm going to read you a short verse. You're going to probably recognize it, and I just want you to think if you know the context of this verse. Do you know what's about to happen after I read this verse in your Bible. John eleven forty. 40. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What did Jesus do right after this? He raised Lazarus from the dead. In other words, Jesus says, guys, this is what my glory looks like, and a dead man gets up. Or how about this, Jesus' first public miracle, turning water into wine, John 2, 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. I want you to note about this, first of all, that this was the first of signs through which he revealed his glory. Jesus revealed his glory through signs and wonders and miracles and healings. I want you to note, secondly, that revealing his glory caused the disciples to believe. Second Corinthians 3, verses 7 through 11. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because, because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? 
For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison to the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? The implication from this passage is that you're carrying something far more glorious than Moses' glory that made his face shine. He has given it to you, past tense. The whole earth is full of it. Jesus explicitly tells us that it's our job, it's God's will for us to bring him glory. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness over the people, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? His glory is upon me. It's not in heaven. Well, you don't have to repeat. It's going to be a long rep. It's like 10 more minutes of repeating. So the glory, I I believe there is glory in heaven because he's the majestic glory, but the glory is upon you now. It's all around you. How much are you willing to pursue it? Oh, I don't, I just pursue God. Jesus is glory. He is the glory. And God is the majestic glory. Pursue glory. You have permission. Glenn, do they have permission? Okay, just want to make sure. You're the gatekeeper. Exodus 33. This is Moses praying to God. If your presence doesn't go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? I want you to understand that from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, God's people have been marked by his presence. Do you understand? In the Garden of Eden, God actually came and walked with them. They heard his footsteps. They hid from him. Cain was marked by God when he got kicked out of the the garden. Uh, Think about the Ark of the Covenant, the cloud that surrounded it by day and the fire that covered it by night. This was glory. Think about Moses' face shining with glory. Think about Acts chapter 2 when the tongues of fire descended. People have always been marked. God's people have always been marked. Even post-biblically, in church history, if you know anything about the first and second great awakenings, they're called the great clamor because they were wild. History has a tendency to tame things. I want to tell you a few stories, and we'll be done here in just a minute. A few stories from the great awakening, the great clamor. They actually, at a certain point, they actually outlawed people from listening uh, in trees because the glory of the Lord would actually knock people out of trees. When the Great Awakening was happening, most of it was here on the East Coast, and these ships coming from Europe and Africa and all these places would come to the East Coast, and before they even got to these cities where these these awakening gatherings were happening, offshore, miles offshore, a glory cloud would surround these ships, not fog, but a green mist would actually surround these ships, and these unsaved sailors, these pirates, all these people would literally get on their knees and beg the Christians on board, what must I do to be saved? That's, that's our heritage. That's our nation. If you go throughout church history, Azusa Street, I mean, even recent history, Asbury College, pick a, pick a spot on the world and throw a dart. There's, there's a, a revival fire happening. We've had a couple of people uh, come in and tell us that they saw fire over our building at Kingdom Living. I'm still praying for the fire department to show up. I want that. <laughs> you know what to pray for now for us. My, I guess my question is this, are we marked? Are we marked? Mark us, God, because it's available. You know, when when enemies came over the hill and saw a pillar of cloud and fire over the Ark of the Covenant, it wasn't just Israel that saw these things in their heads. Their enemies could see that they were marked. They might not have believed in that God, but you couldn't deny that God. When people encounter us, do they get Jesus? Or do they get someone who knows about Jesus? Our our expectations have been far too low for far too long. What did you come here for tonight? 
when it comes to Christianity and church culture, we cry out for more people and more volunteers and more classes and all these things. But actually what we need to cry out for is a greater measure of glory. We want to be marked. We want to overflow because then we'll be made like him. We actually don't make space for more chairs, more people. We, we, we make space for him. And we don't give him parts of our service. We give him the room. You were created to encounter his glory. You were created to carry his glory. You were created to give him glory. Ask him for it. If we're not expecting glory, that's not presumptuous, it's a lack mindset. Because it fills the whole whole earth. He doesn't run out. It's who he is. He's endless. He's the majestic, endless glory. You think he has a, a, a supply that's running out? It's endless. Ask for more.